So there is a range of physical violence that includes sort of serious and injurious violence, so violence where they would have had to seek uh, medical attention um, through to like a huge range of that. Um, a thing I noticed particularly about the physical violence was that um, men were often attacked when they were asleep or in the shower, so when they were more vulnerable in that sense. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, six o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. Today you're going to hear from Dr Elizabeth Bates, who's Principal Lecturer at the University of Cumbria. Her PhD focused on exploring the personality and psychopathy pathological predictors of men's and women's partner violence. Her postdoctoral work has focused on exploring the experience of male victims and she's published papers on their experience of physical and psychological abuse, barriers to help seeking, post-separation abuse and the impact on children of living in an abusive home. Liz is also trustee of the Mankind Initiative, a UK charity supporting male victims of domestic violence, and is also chair of the BPS Male Psychology Section. Delighted to have you here today, Liz. Welcome. Thank you very much. Very nice to uh, meet you, uh, Liz. So if we could begin, can you tell us about your career path and how you came to be so interested in, in male victims of intimate partner violence? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I did psychology as my undergraduate degree um, and I remember that I chose it because I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do um, and I was always told it was a really good degree to choose if you are not sure because of the transferable skills and all the graduate sort of qualities you come out with. Um, and I remember really clearly um, in my third year in a module called The Psychology of Violent Behaviour um, Professor Nikki Graham Kevin, who then became my PhD supervisor, she did a lecture um, and one of our assessments was around women's violence and the women's use of violence towards male partners. And I was so, it was such an interesting topic. The, the sort of psychology of the violent behaviour has always been of an interest to me. Um, but I just remember thinking, sitting there thinking, I didn't know that that happened. I didn't know that men could be victims. And so then in reading a lot more about it and researching more about it, um, the research evidence is, is huge. The evidence is that you know women can be violent, men can be victims, um, women can be violent within same-sex relationships, men can be victims in same-sex relationships. And I think the more that I read and the more evidence I saw that this happened, but the just complete lack of um, awareness, I suppose, is what really kind of spurred me on. So after doing my PhD, which where I was looking at men's and women's partner violence, so that had come from <laughs> this lecture um, and working with Nikki. Um, after doing that that research for my doctorate, I just wanted to focus then specifically on working with male victims. So there was less, I mean, there is a, a body of work that evidences and it sort of explores men's victimisation, but I wanted to kind of pursue that in a little bit more detail and kind of really explore that. Because the more that I did and the more that I worked with people like um, the Mankind Initiative, the more I realised that there are huge numbers of male victims, but they're just not getting the same access to help and support. And so it became a bit of a, well, it is a passion for me. It's something that I feel really, really passionate about and something that I'm trying my best with my work to have an impact on. Thank you. Thank you. That's really interesting. You've particularly focused on barriers to help seeking in men. How did you do the research and how did you get men who can be very reluctant about these things? How did you get them to tell their stories of victimisation? And that's a really good question. Um, so the, yeah, we know that men are less likely to seek help, sort of more broadly speaking, and it, obviously in a very generalised way. So they're less likely, for example, to go to the doctor than women are. So there's an evidence base that sort of really has explored that. Um, and I knew that that was creating barriers. I knew there were barriers for men asking for help. So what I did with my research, my first um, study that I did that focused really on uh, men's experiences is I chose to kind of take a slightly different tact with the research. So the research that was existing at the time that had focused just on men's experiences had used either sort of interview based studies, which I think is quite a um, incredibly powerful method, but really, you know, requires a man to be able to sit across from you and talk about those experiences. Um, there'd been help seeking samples of so people who had already overcome some of those barriers to ask for help and then that data had been used 
or there were studies that had been advertised for men who had experienced domestic violence and we know that many men don't identify in that way because it has so historically been constructed as something that happens you know happens to women so I wanted to kind of try and do something that would allow me to get that really in-depth qualitative data but then try and capture a broader range of experience so I utilised an online qualitative anonymous survey so that was important because um, the Mankind Initiative's data suggests that there's around 70%, I always mean to look that number up before I talk about it and I forget, there's around 70% of callers um, wouldn't have rung if it hadn't been anonymous. So I know that anonymity is really important in men's sort of initial stages of disclosure, so I wanted to try and mirror that. So I used this survey to then basically try and help overcome some of those barriers so I advertised it as for men who'd experienced aggression and control so purposefully avoided um, terms like domestic violence and as I say I had that as an anonymous survey um, so 161 men took part in that first initial survey that I did um, and 25% of them had never told anybody else about the abuse so I know that it meant that I'd captured a, a slightly broader range of those experiences obviously not you know the, the experiences of everybody because there were still those barriers so with the help seeking study that I did with um, Julie Taylor who I worked with at the University of Cumbria and um, a couple of our students we looked at we used the same sort of approach because understanding those barriers to help seeking um, we need to overcome some of those barriers to obviously try and talk to men about it. So we used a very similar method and we'd captured within that then men who both had and hadn't sought help. So we were able to capture those experiences and really understand actually what those barriers had been. It's really interesting to hear that, Liz, and it makes me think of we did an audit in the service that I worked in because many of the men had had multiple contacts with professionals before they came to our service but weren't identified as having been um, experienced victimisation of any any form and by removing the words of um, abuse what we found is that actually people were disclosing really high levels of child abuse and trauma um, but by not labelling it as such it seemed to give people permission to do that so it's really interesting to to hear that was so significant in recruiting people to your research. I think that some of the research as well um, has sort of evidence that where you list behaviours, men will identify that they've experienced what are domestic violence behaviours, but then when asked if you're a victim of domestic violence, they will then say no. Not all men, obviously, but so there is obviously this gap between actually recognising the behaviour that's happening, but identifying as that victim of domestic violence. Thank you. What kind of places did you uh, advertise in? The study was advertised through um, some help seeking services, so Mankind Initiative has been really supportive of my work and, and advertised that um, and I contacted other places like Abuse Men in Scotland and um, other sort of places where I know they help and support men but I also utilised the power of Twitter as well and social media which has, has been really really um it's been a really good support, I think, of my research because it does. I, I recognise that it still only captures like a specific, you know, people obviously that are engaged in that. But it meant that my survey got much further in terms of the reach of it. And I know there were men that had completed, um, well, a range of the surveys that I've done that have completed from outside the UK because it is getting sort of shared and retweeted in that way. Um, I know, for example, there's um, a group in Australia, one in three, um, they shared a couple of my research requests and so I know ca I captured the voices of some Australian men there as well. So it's um, that sort of, that the social media presence in that way has been really helpful in that sense. Hmm. Thank you. So you may not know the answer to this question, but I was wondering whether um, all your sample were heterosexual, whether you had a balance between gay and, and straight men? I'd advertise my study as um, one for men who had experienced violence and control from women. So I didn't then ask about sexual orientation, but the focus was understanding those experiences of, of men who had experienced the violence from women. Thank you. So what did you find? I mean, if you could sum up your results, what kind of experiences did men have? So across the research that I've done, um, men have shared with me a real range of abusive behaviours that they experience. 
So there is a range of physical violence that includes sort of serious and injurious violence, so violence where they would have had to seek uh, medical attention um, through to like a huge range of that. Um, a thing I noticed particularly about the physical violence was that um, men were often attacked when they were asleep or in the shower, so when they were more vulnerable in that sense. And it's one of the things that I've been asked about quite a lot is, is you know, the nature of how can a woman, you know, who is tip typically not as physically big or strong as men to sort of be able to do that sort of you know damage and that sort of harm but i think that a lot of the uh, men reported that there was the use of weapons not necessarily like knives and guns kind of weapons but the use of objects as weapons and also the fact they were attacked when they were vulnerable which i think points to either consciously or unconsciously some women using those tactics to be able to then overcome potential imbalances in in size and strength in that way um, they've reported instances as well of sexual violence, so being coerced into sexual acts and being forced to penetrate. Um, there was a lot of emotional and psychological abuse as well and coercive control through a variety of different means and, and mechanisms and sort of you know strategies that were being used to enact that. Um, and this violence and control had also continued post-separation. So a lot of the men had described the way that actually the end of the relationship wasn't the end of the abuse. It would often continue or it might change. So, for example, some of the physical violence would be less because men were obviously not as likely to be in a physical proximity in the same way, but that there were then different mechanisms that were used. So, for example, for men that were fathers, um, the children became a tool that was used quite frequently. And the barriers that existed to help seeking were sort of really multifaceted. Um, and we saw across the range of those experiences that the overarching sort of theme that really captured it was this idea of a stigmatised gender. So the fact that they were men ultimately was the underlying factor about a range of different um, factors that were impacting on that experience, whether it was the barriers to help seeking or the reactions to help seeking when they'd tried. So, for example, men had described um, not knowing where to go for help, but then men had, who had tried to seek help had described, for example, being laughed at or not being believed or being accused of being a perpetrator or, you know, the assumption that he must have done something to deserve it, that kind of narrative. Um, but also the fact that they, I think it was kind of captured within the way they talked about not necessarily knowing where to go, being f um, fearful, sorry, of the reaction that they would get being fearful of ultimately some of those other factors that included losing children and that sort of thing. Um, so there was a, re a real range of different factors, so there was a really kind of complex, um, there were complex experiences in terms of those barriers. Thank you, that's very helpful that these are the main reasons why men find it difficult to speak up I suppose you're describing that. Um, just to go back to your research uh, for a minute, did anyone ever challenge the, the anonymity uh, uh, in your research and question the uh, validity of it? Again, um, yes, I have been. It has been challenged um, in my research before. So the use of the anonymous question questionnaire, sorry, has been a really important factor. I think in getting men to share and to open up, but it has been challenged in terms of the fact that I am taking them at their word and that I'm not working with their partners and sort of almost fact-checking what they're saying in that way. Um, and whilst it's possible that that will mean I've captured accounts that are, you know, not necessarily, or that maybe somebody sort of, you know, lying or manipulating it in that way, um, it's, for me, really important that we always believe, you know, we believe those accounts in that sense. And I also would counter slightly that we would never, we would never sort of fact check in that sense women's accounts. We would always and assume that women were telling the truth, whereas I'm sure some women would also have, you know, could also lie and manipulate in that way. So it kind of for me is we believe everybody or we question everybody. And for me, I always come from a position of wanting to believe people's accounts when they're sharing those experiences. I also think particularly for when men and women have barriers in trying to get help and support and fear in not being believed, any sort of hint that they might not be could just then close down, just increase those barriers and stop that sort of help seeking process there and then. Absolutely. I think that's borne out in um, clinical practice as well. And certainly every, every time I've presented data on um, male victimisation, I always get asked, how do you know they're not lying? And I'm, I'm, I really don't think that would get asked about if I was talking about female yeah. 
uh, people in prison. Uh, but also my experience of men is that they really balk at talking a, about their experiences of victimisation. They'd much rather talk about the bad things that they've done. Um, obviously, I'm talking about a prison population. Um, they'd much rather talk about what they've done than they would talk about what's happened to them. That feels a bigger step for them to, to have to take. Are there any differences, do you think, between men and women's abilities to speak up about their victimisation? Um, I think that there are barriers to help seeking um, for domestic violence, regardless of gender identity or sexual orientation. Um, I think that there are some groups that experience more barriers in that way and find it harder to speak out. I think historically, because of the excellent work that was done by the women's liberation movement and the feminist movement in raising the profile of the issue of domestic violence and the fact that women were experiencing violence in relationships, they were experiencing sexual violence and rape within their marriages as well. I think all of that work did such a huge amount in why we're having this conversation today because you know we were talking we're talking about domestic violence now as something that is such a significant issue. Um, but I think that the consequence of the focus of that has meant that we have created stereotypes that mean that we assume that men are perpetrators and women are victims. And I think then that that lack of awareness of men's victimisation, and that's awareness that I didn't have as I've sort of already described up until you know I started doing work in the area, I think does create barriers. It creates barriers in terms of the fact that I think some men don't necessarily recognise their victimisation as easily, potentially. Um, although we know that it's hard to recognise that in the relationship. Um, I think that the availability of services and support and everything is not necess hasn't historically certainly been as available to men as it has to women. And I still think that there is a huge amount to do in terms of the social reactions to men's and women's victimisation. So um, an example that I would give is that men's victimisation, particularly at the hands of women, is still used as a tool of humour on TV and in films and stuff so we would laugh at a man's victimisation um, and there's an example from Friends that I always use where Joey is going out with a, a woman that is particularly small and petite and she hurt, she hits him and they all laugh and they make fun of him so those as examples even though obviously that's an older show now those sort of examples we still see in the media and I think that that can be damaging as well because I think men then feel like perhaps they're on their own or perhaps they will be laughed at or perhaps they won't be believed. So I think there's a combination of these factors that I do think can make it harder for men sometimes to ask for help and to disclose those experiences. Thank you. And in um, your paper on post-separation abuse, you talk about parental alienation. I wondered if you could describe that for the listeners if people aren't familiar with the concept and explain why it's so controversial. Yeah, so parental alienation is a term that was coined um, that describes the way in which um, a child can become alienated from a parent. So, for example, um, one parent might manipulate the relationship with the other, what they then call target parent, so that that parent becomes alienated from that child. So, for example, they may withhold contact or they may manipulate the relationship so the child feels differently about the other parent. Um, as a term, it's quite controversial um, for a number of reasons, not least of which I think being that the evidence base that exists has not always been the strongest in terms of you know rigorous research evidence. So quite a lot of anecdotal evidence and quite a lot of um, not necessarily the best methodologically in that sense. Um, but I think another reason that it's controversial as well is that um, some of the original people that talked about it tried to sort of suggest that parental alienation syndrome was something that we could diagnose children with. So where a child has become really wrapped up and involved in that abuse and so is engaging in that abusive behaviour, um, we would see then that they would be diagnosed in this way. So I'm not really comfortable, obviously, with pathologising children in any way in that sense, but I think that that's also added to that controversy. And what it means is now that when you use that term, there's a kind of there is a reaction to it. I think regardless of how the label that we give it, I see within the literature on women's experiences and obviously on the work that I've done with men's experiences as well, I see evidence of those behaviours. So the fact that um, parents can withhold contact, they can move and not tell the other parent where they're going, um, they can use sort of other mechanisms to turn the child against the other target parent. And that could be, for example, um, subtle things like not calling him dad or not her calling her mum around them and calling them by their first name. But it could also be quite um, 
well, I would label abusive behaviours. So, for example, one of the men in one of my studies, um, his ex-wife had told their four-year-old daughter that he'd killed their cat and that he wanted to kill her and her sister. And so that, as an example, is where, you know, the contact is there, potentially, but obviously that is changing and challenging and damaging that relationship with that child and her father. So those are kind of some of the examples in which it is. And as I say, it's a controversial term, but I definitely see evidence across the, the literature base of the behaviours that, that are used and engaged in. It's, it's kind of a mechanism of control in that way. Thank you, Liz. And yeah, I've been involved in a couple of cases, one where with one with a, a mother um, where alienation had arisen, but, but one where with a male also. And I think in both cases, the court seemed to find it problematic to find a way to, to break the pattern there. Um, I, I'm not even sure it's even recognised with in the English courts as a concept although it is in it is in scotland but it does seem as though the, pa- the courts are powerless to to find a way to um overcome these barriers to contact once they've become entrenched within the family and i think one of the other things actually just kind of off the bat um, to respond as well is the fact that the way it's talked about as a term um so this idea of parental alienation within the literature as well is really controversial because it is taught a lot sorry it's been described as just a tool that men use to continue to try and control and abuse women so when men are cl- you know claiming parental alienation in that way the impact is that you know it's always oh, just an abusive man trying to kind of continue to try and do that rather than it being seen as a legitimate you know a father who is desperate to have contact with his child as well so i think yeah it is a very controversial area thank you <clears throat> Do, do men talk much about fear of their partners? It's quite easy for people to assume a big man can't be frightened of a small a small woman because of the differences in their respective strengths. So I was interested in what kind of emotional language gets used. That's a really interesting question. Um, I think that it's important to kind of know that men and women, um, so boys and girls, are brought up um, and are socialised, I think, to, to handle and recognise and deal with fear differently. Um, so I think that where women may demonstrate more fear of things like physical danger, obviously, and, and anything that will be life-threatening, men aren't necessarily always um, socialised to kind of respond in the same way. You know, if you, if you look at some of the evolutionary theory, for example. Um, I've definitely seen within my data that men do describe being frightened of their partners in terms of the potential for physical violence and, and the potential for you know, life-threatening violence in that way. Um, but also men, I would say, more commonly within my day to talk about the fear of what could happen, what she could do. So it is a fear, but it is, for example, fear of the fact that she may have said that she'll make a false allegation and so he'd get arrested or that she would take his children away. So men do talk about fear and being scared, but not necessarily always of the, the sort of physical danger that I think we are used to obviously seeing within the women's literature where they definitely see um, that as a strong theme. So I think that that sort of fear of the physical side of it is just one part of you know a range of things that for me men have talked about being being scared of and being fearful of that's really interesting thank you uh, it's other differences in terms of the post-separation um experiences that men and women have in terms of things like harassment and stalking um, I would say that there are quite a lot of similarities. So stalking and harassment type behaviours are definitely seen within the accounts of men and of women. Um, equally, things like parental alienation are seen in the accounts of men and women. But I think that where I see some differences are within something that's called legal and administrative aggression, which is something that was coined by um, some Australian researchers about 10 years ago. Um, and that is the way in which legal and administrative systems can be used as a mechanism of coercive control and I think because the domestic violence sector historically and still to some extent now is set up to see men as perpetrators and women as victims what it can mean is that some women can then and and don't get me wrong women do experience this too men can use these systems but I think the stereotypes and everything that exists mean that some women are able to use the systems more more effectively for the want of a better word in terms of um, a tool of control so for example through making false allegations or even just the threat of making a false allegation 
through manipulating the family court, through obviously um, parental alienation and those sorts of behaviours as well. So I think the system potentially means that men may experience that more. That's quite a useful concept, actually, isn't it? The idea of legal and administrative abuse. Because I just think about the way that some people misuse complaint systems, for instance. So that can also be used as a way to um, attack therapists. So I'm not not that people don't. You know, there are times when making a complaint is exactly the right thing to do, but there are also times when those systems do get misused mm. by people in order to enact anger and and hatred towards towards other people so quite like that that phrase what should we be doing differently oh that's a good question um one of the things i've been reflecting on and, and talking about a bit more recently i suppose is in thinking about the barriers to help seeking that um, men experience is there's often been a focus on how we should get men to change to fit within the systems that we have So to help men overcome those barriers and therefore fit into the nice little kind of box that we have. Whereas I think um, there is potentially a a degree of that in terms of supporting men. I think that actually systems and services might have more responsibility as well in terms of being able to be approachable to men. So, so that men would feel like they can come forward and ask for help and would feel like they can do that. And whether that is, for example, you know, in, in... like mankind's helpline is anonymous for example that's clearly something from the data that is helping men start that process of disclosure and sort of seeking help so understanding the barriers that men experience and then trying to use that information not just to change men in that way but actually to change the services and the systems that we have to try and facilitate that i think that that's an avenue that we don't focus on enough just to kind of go sorry I'm sorry just to go back as well I think that um how we get men to talk about how they feel and everything I'm not suggesting we don't do that because I think that some some areas where we understand these barriers can be really helpful in terms of supporting men to be able to open up more and seek help which has an impact for you know a range of issues such as things around mental health but in terms of domestic violence I just think the focus has been too much on helping men get over those barriers to come to those services where actually I think on that side more could be done to support them I was wondering um, as well about being a bit clearer about services being available to men. I was just wondering, for instance, about the usefulness of um, violence against women and girls strategy um, being used to capture um, what happens for men. Language and the use of language is really important in in all well, I suppose in, in relation to everything that I've said really in terms of men recognizing their own experiences and feeling like they can go to a service or a, an organization for support. So the violence against women and girls strategy being so gendered in its framework is is damaging for men in that it means that men don't see themselves as fitting within a domestic violence um, area that obviously is, is under that strategy. Um, what the violence against women and girls strategy does is incredibly important for addressing issues of violence against women and girls but for me personally I feel like we need a parallel strategy that then actually recognises and looks at violence against men and boys as well so I think that that's one thing in terms of the language that's used it's really impactful um, for men because they don't see themselves within that and it impacts how they feel about their experience but I think also sometimes where we have services that do support men um, so they support men and women for example I think it needs to be really clear and I know this is something that Mark at Mankind has talked about before it needs to be clear that they support men as well so it's not enough to just say like domestic violence service as if you know not just for women it needs to be that actually we support men as well because again for such a long time that language has been something that happens to women and it's something that men do then it means that when we um, are trying to kind of make it look available to men and be available to men, we need to be really explicit about the fact we support men as well here. That kind of um, explicitness in terms of, again, helping them overcome some of those barriers. So, Liz, it it does seem that there's an increasing body of uh, research looking at the experience of, of male victims of violence. And... With some exceptions, this mainly seems to be conducted by women. Do you have any thoughts about why that could be? <laughs> that's an interesting. That's a really interesting question. 
Um, I know that there are um, a lot of male researchers as well out there doing work now, and historically some of the um, some of the really early stuff that I refer to is still a lot, like the development of something called the conflict tactics scale, which was one of the first measures that really highlighted the um, range of abuse that could be experienced. Was developed by Murray Strauss, um, who um, did, you know started a huge amount of the body of work in this area. But I do I do know what you mean in terms of the fact that there are quite a lot of women working in this area. Um, as to why that could be, I suppose. Pers if I think personally in some ways um, one of the things that has always been a challenge to the fact that um, so like the early gendered models for example of domestic violence see power and control as something that men do so they use their male privilege and they use the fact there's gender inequality to really um, manipulate and control women and the idea being that women don't use control in that way but for example, I was bullied at school by girls and I saw the way they used indirect aggression and really manipulative tactics and lots of that sort of behaviour. So this idea that women can't be emotionally manipulative or um, lie or deceive or you know all of the sort of tactics you see on these coercive control and behaviour scales, the idea that women can't do that, I just always saw as being completely untrue because I could see evidence of that. Just generally, you know, you see sometimes women can behave in that way. And again, I think that um, perhaps to some degree, I don't know, knowing, you know, as a woman, what women are capable of, I, I don't know, that's just my own experience, perhaps. But you, as a woman, have developed a particular you know, interest, and do you think that's linked to the experience that you had at school then? Um, I don't know. No, probably not. And, you know, like in a deep sort of, you know, the way where my passion comes from no I think that I've never had a problem recognizing what women could do um in in that sort of way and in, in those sorts of in, as I say indirect and emotionally uh, manipulative tactics I suppose but the fact that I suppose a lot of people don't believe that women can do that p potentially might have been linked to it but for me it's always just come from the fact that there is just this huge number of men that don't have that access to help and support that women do um, and the impact that that has is so detrimental on their health and well-being that that is really the, the driver for me. I wonder if it's safer for women to discuss it than men, though. I'm just thinking about, you know, you can't help but notice, certainly if social media is anything to go by, the temperature <clears throat> whenever there's discussions around male victimisation, um, it does seem to attract quite a lot of vitriol. And I wonder if it actually feels safer for women to be talking about women's violence than it does for men to be talking about women's violence um that's a really good point actually and i do think some of the stuff that i say which is always always driven by the evidence that i have i do think it's potentially heard differently because i'm a woman um but i suppose the driver my focus has been on male victims because of obviously what I've already described but for me it's also about an in it's an inclusivity thing for me like actually there should be the availability of help and support for any victim regardless of any group that they belong to whether it is gender identity whether it is sexual orientation age bracket I'm writing some stuff at the moment about older men whether it's sort of there are all these different sort of intersections of characteristics that people can experience and it shouldn't be that your membership of any of those groups interferes with how you get access to help and support so it's really gender is such a huge focus within this area of how we talk about it um, but for me it's it's about inclusivity and there are also a lot more female psychologists than there are male psychologists that's also well, a very good so. point yeah <laughs> <laughs> and of course the question that hangs around that is why is that the case it's a very similar kind of question I wasn't expecting you to have an answer. I think I think we've been asking that question for decades. You know, it's like asking the question, why are there so few people from an ethnic minority background going into TCs and other kinds of therapy? We've been asking the question for decades and are no closer to getting the answer now than we were 20 years ago. So I wonder if I can jump ahead, though, because I wanted to touch a bit upon the idea of uh, female perpetrators, which you've alluded to, but we haven't talked about in depth. And of course, that came up in the uh, recent trial between uh, uh, where, where Johnny Depp was um, prosecuting uh, 
Amber Heard. Um, and I wonder if there were, in your view, any particular issues around that which would either to do with having a public trial about such issues or about the issues of violence which uh, were described in that trial. Um, that's an interesting question, very topical. Um, I think that the trial, there's been a you know a libel case on one part and then the trial by public opinion <laughs> on the other side, largely through um, social media. And I know it's attracted some real diversity in terms of opinion about what's happened and everything. And obviously I'm not able to comment on actually the nature of what happened within that relationship. But I think it has... Um, it has a number of impacts and one of them is the fact that actually we've talked about Johnny Depp as a very high profile famous um, man who has described experiences of being abused by his female partner and I think that the response we've had to that publicly has been for me, I mean you know with the extremes and some of the arguments and stuff aside but I think it's been quite um, interesting and, and encouraging really to see the way in which actually people have come out to support him in his experience you know that he's described so actually recognizing that men can be victims i think that's been a really powerful um thing to happen as an outcome of this and it's interesting because i've been working in this area now for, you know like focusing on men's experiences for over 10 years now and i think i've seen a real shift in actually that recognition and the awareness that there is obviously there's still you know i was as i would always say there's still quite a lot of work to be done but I definitely have seen that shift and that outcome, as I say, of what happened and people's responses to his um, described victimisation has been really, really powerful, I think. You alluded there to um, the uh, one of the one of the factors that's very striking, I think, in, the, in that case has been the general public's desire to wade in and hurl abuse at either party. And that did make me wonder whether you'd experienced any, any abuse as a consequence of your research. Um, abuse, abuse might be a strong word, no. Um, I get some really mixed reactions to the work that I do. Um, the most important one for me has always been the men that have written to me, you know, that have emailed me or got in touch with me and told me how, how much it means that somebody's researching this because they thought they were on their own. So that has always been the most powerful um, message that I've got in terms of, of the work that I've done. But I do get some negative reactions. I get negative reactions from people who think that by talking about men's victimisation it is somehow in some way taken away from women's experiences or from women's resources. And I was really, really clear, as I've kind of already talked about, it's never, never about that. Absolutely not. We know that women still make up the majority victim group, as the crime survey statistics suggest. But for me, as I said, it's about us being able to talk about men's experiences and get that help and support. And also for the women, for the women who are being violent, who are currently not getting that, that access to help and support for the, you know, like the interventions and stuff that could be available for them. So there's been a, a negative response in that sense in people thinking that I'm trying to take away from women, which I'm not. Um, but it's also such a polarising area that I also feel like I get labelled you know like there's these extremes so for example i get labeled as a men's rights activist quite a lot which I, i'm not um i support and work really tirelessly hopefully you know for the for the men that i'm trying to support but i don't identify as a men's rights activist in that way at all um but i think that the the reaction and again it comes again to the fact it's gender i think if we were talking about any other area of violence research we wouldn't be sort of having this same sort of discussion but the fact that domestic violence is so heavily influenced by gender I think really really drives a lot of the sort of um, the reactions and the responses that you get. Can you say a bit more about your thoughts about um, research into the um, to female perpetrators of, of, of violence? Yeah my um, my work itself has only ever focused on working with male victims um, rather than the female perpetrators but I know that there are researchers that are doing that and for my PhD I was exploring the predictors of men's and women's perpetration victimization in that way and um, I think that there is work that's been done by people that are focusing on women's perpetration but the, the, the broad literature that exists out there suggests that there are more similarities and differences in terms of what um, can lead men and women to be violent in relationships so where as I say historically that sort of gendered framework has really um, 
has suggested that men are violent because of gender, because of that male privilege, um, and that women's violence is driven by self-defence in that way. Um, the research doesn't support that. Obviously, that is the case in some some instances. Don't get me wrong, but actually, the the predictors of men's and women's violence can be very similar. It includes things like childhood trauma, um, adverse childhood experiences, use of drugs and alcohol, like the range of different things that influences. Um, is quite similar with obviously there are some gender specific um, examples that are then seen as well but I've worked really with victims rather than perpetrators. So you're also chair of the psychology of men section of the BPS Liz. Is this a necessary group? Can you say something about its work? Yes yeah, so I'm currently the chair of the male psychology section and um, have been since November so I'm in my current um, first year organising my first conference for them as well. Um, it is a necessary group, it is a necessary group, but again there's been quite a strong reaction to that um, from some people as well. It is really important to allow us to focus on areas where men are dispro disproportionately experiencing some social issues, such as for example thinking around mental health and suicide, thinking about education, there are some areas Within, that is, you know, within the realm of psychology and the issues that we deal with as psychologists where we see that men are disadvantaged. And also about understanding the way in which, so for example, the work that I've done with Barriers to Help Seeking for male victims, it's about being able to work with and understand the different issues that men are facing in a way to then be able to inform things like interventions, programmes, support systems, advice, anything of that way. So yeah, I do feel like it is really necessary. Um, but one of the things that I hope to achieve as chair is to try and dispel um, some of the myths and misconceptions that exist about it. So one of the ac accusations I think people often make is that just by virtue of being male that you have privilege and therefore don't need a focus on, on vulnerability. What, I wonder what your retort to that would be. Um, I understand. I understand where that's come from. Um, and historically, obviously, men have experienced a huge amount of privilege, and I understand what that that would inform a comment of, of that way. Um, but for me, there are so many areas where men, men are experiencing disadvantage, and as I say, issues that are disproportionately affecting them. And for us to be able to focus and understand those issues, for me, ultimately helps, well, informs how we would then go about helping and supporting Um there are different areas where, for example, the women in equality section is focused very much on the issues that affect women. And I feel like we could work really well together as well because the overlap actually of issues is there. The interests are the same in terms of actually trying to understand issues that are affecting the group that we're working with, with a goal to try and improve these situations. So I understand that, but I don't agree. So, so picking up, picking up... Uh from that uh, then Liz do you think you could say that there are some lessons to be learned from your research that apply it in a much more broad way to societal life uh, sorry what do you mean are there lessons to be learned from your research that we could apply to other areas of, of life as well oh, okay that's a good question um I think so, yes, because some of the area, some of the sorry, the research that I've got and the data that I've got that has helped me understand men's experiences and the way in which we might sort of, as, as I say, help and support men who have experienced domestic violence could feed into wider conversations, for example, about men's help seeking around mental health, for example. So the understanding of the barriers that men face in talking about those experiences, potentially in showing that vulnerability, in admitting being a victim, sort of these things that we know from the literature and from my own research that men do find really challenging, we could use the knowledge that you know I've gained through my own research and I do think it could apply to further other areas around things, like I said, like mental health, help, health help seeking generally, and also potentially understandings within like the criminal justice system and things as well. Thank you. Can you tell us, Liz, you're a trustee of the Mankind Initiative, and we've we've you've alluded to us a couple of times earlier on in this in this conversation. Can you tell us a little bit about their work? Yeah, so the Mankind Initiative is um, one of the leading UK charities that works with male victims of domestic violence, and I'm really proud to be a trustee and work with them. I've worked with them for a number of years. Um, they are they run an anonymous helpline for male victims um, and the helpline is there to support male victims as well as 
um, family and friends of uh, male victims that have called and asked for help and support in terms of how to support someone that they care about. Um, and also practitioners and service providers and people that also get in touch and ask for advice in terms of supporting men when they have um, come across that within their practice. They also work really well in terms of, um, they work for advo you know, advocating for male victims, so sort of lobbying in terms of policy and practice to ensure that male victims are represented within you know, the guidance, legislation, etc. as well. So they work really, really hard to ensure that men get that access to help and support and that they're represented in the way that is really important. Um, but it is also a charity. But yeah, their, their work is, is sort of really multifaceted in that way, but ultimately, you know, like about raising awareness and supporting male victims. So it sounds like it could be useful for us to include a link to them in our show notes perhaps as well. Yes, yeah, that'd be really good. They run, the, the helpline is run by donations only. So yeah, so if that's possible to include that. You've heard many powerful accounts of real people's trauma within your research. How do you protect yourself and your own well-being? How do you stay positive as a person? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I work with a really wonderful group of people, so the, um, both within the university that I work in, but also my research collaborations outside of that. I work with a wonderful group of people, and I think that that really helps because you can sort of debrief and, and have those shared experiences and be able to talk about them in that safe space. Um, I think it's important um, it, the thing that really drives me is obviously the impact that I want to have and that keeps me going sometimes when it is really tough but I suppose in terms of my own sort of self care and looking after myself I really um, I love getting outdoors, I love exercise and getting involved in, in that sort of thing as well so being able to kind of go outside and get out of the little space that I work in you know, the get away from the computer and that sort of stuff is really important um, and I, yeah, I have a really strong network of friends and family as well, which I also think really helps. They are interested in the work that I do, and so I can share, you know, findings. I can share kind of um, the stuff that I'm doing with them. Um, so that also that's also really helps. I've got a really got a really good strong support network. Thank you. Did we discuss the psychology men conference? No, I, I realised that when I was talking about the male section, I should have really said something about that. Um, so I'm in the process of organising um, our first conference, which is being um, held at UCLan in Preston on the 20th and 21st of June, so only in a few weeks' time. Um, it's our first in-person conference um, as an official BPS section, so it's really, it's really, really exciting. Um, we have some really good keynote speakers. Um, so Naomi Murphy, you are one of our keynote speakers, which we're very excited about. Um, Professor Nikki Graham Kevin, who obviously I've worked with a lot, I'm really excited for her being there. And, and Martin Seeger as well. He is um, one of the founding members of the section and was really key in terms of getting the section recognised. So we've got some really good keynote speakers, and we finally put our finally put our program together as well. And some really good. Um, theme sort of sessions about different issues that are impacting men so for example there is a, a session on domestic violence um, which I'm well I must say hopefully no, I am presenting in um, and actually interestingly related to your question about um, the Johnny Depp trial as well one two of my PhD students are presenting um, a critical discourse analysis that is exploring the way in which the UK trial was represented in the media and sort of the language and stuff that was used so that will be really interesting um, and then we've got sessions around mental health and um, working with men within practice and help seeking settings as well so it's, it's a really really strong program with some really excellent expert speakers so I'm really really excited about it and again I think we can include a link to that within the within the notes as well yes please so when is it actually um, so it's on the 20th and the 21st of June this month brilliant thank okay. you very much Liz that's been great to have you on today